Good day, everybody. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all, uh, panelists, all the panelists here and attendees, on behalf of ICLE, um, to the city and the city of Sao Paulo, our wonderful hosts, to this session uh, that is going to focus on greening our urban tapestry, collaboration and solutions for nature and biodiversity. My name is Kirby Brunt. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the ICLE Deputy Secretary General, but I'm also very honored and pleased uh, to be there heading up our global biodiversity work together with my colleagues Ingrid Kutsi, uh, Ivana, and many others from ICLE offices around the world, and with so many of our partners here with us today, including UNEP. The, um, I will moderate this session, and here we're going to have uh, an, a very, very rich session with a number of panels, as I mentioned. The experts tell us that 55% of global GDP, equivalent to an estimated $58 trillion, is moderately or highly dependent on nature, and that half of the world's population, as we know, already lives in cities, generating more than 80% of the global GDP. We know that cities and regions are crucial hubs for sustainable development and innovation. And we can also play a key role in contributing to the global biodiversity goals. We cannot only do that, we must do that. This session will highlight what cities around the world are already doing to reduce biodiversity loss and restore our ecosystems, thereby contributing to global biodiversity targets and the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which we are in right now. We are honored to have Ms. Gulnara Roll, um, Head of Cities Unit at the Climate Change Division of UNEP here with us to open this session and share global perspective from UNEP on cities and regions and their important role in working with nature to prove nature-based solutions and protect ecosystems. I can only say, Gulnara, it is such a pleasure to work with your city's unit, unit in UNEP and with you in particular, what a leader you are of that unit. Please, Gulnara, the opening address is yours. Thank you. Then maybe I don't go to the podium, but I could sit also next to you, and uh, you hear me well right now, yeah? Uh, so, uh, really pleasure, uh, really pleasure seeing you all. I mean, it's really exciting to engage this discussion. Um, I just, I'm just coming actually from Manaus here in, uh, 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 in, in Brazil. Do you hear it? It's okay? Yeah. So. I, I was really privileged to be yesterday in Manaus, uh, where I went to tribal park. So Dayson Braga here from the city of Manaus. So thanks a lot for that visit. And I really saw how, um, what cities are doing, the complexities uh, of the pilot projects of different activities on nature-based solutions they have to address. And specifically, I just wanted to make a short story because I was so excited to see that case study you know, the tribal park in Manaus is uh, really about addressing the needs of uh, indigenous people. So it's a, it's a park where uh, people from indigenous communities live and it's formally informal settlements. Uh, it's also a place of Amazonian forests. It's a place where people also need to do their livelihood. And at the same time, we have to protect the nature, you know, so uh, I really appreciated how the city is dealing with these complexities. You know, they are uh, planting not just trees, but they are planting the native trees, uh, but also planting the fruit trees, the cacao trees, and also dealing with uh, issues like landslides. You know, the, the soils are soils are very uh, you know soft. So I think, um, and here in the hall, we have so many of these kind of case studies where, in the very specific context. We are dealing with very complex issues. Uh, so I really appreciate if, uh, of all these experiences and all this, your many, many years of different experiences, different contexts of working with these kind of topics. 
And therefore, we're really pleased to work with ICLE, with all the cities in the ICLE membership on this. And just I wanted also to say a bit more about what uh, the UNEP Cities uh, Unit is doing. So we're working uh, in several directions. So we're working, for instance, a lot with buildings. We have a global community, uh, a global alliance for building constructions. And you know that buildings give 40% uh, of uh, carbon emissions, uh, of, uh, which is a huge issue for the climate change, for instance. So we're working, uh, for instance, on issues of uh, materials. And for instance, one of the questions I asked yesterday from Manaus, you know, what kind of materials can we use? Can we use traditional, traditional materials, construction materials? Uh, because, you know, every second day, if I'm not mistaken, they're building like the city like Paris, you know? So we should be thinking about uh, the buildings, you know, how we plan them and how we build them, what kind of materials we're using them how much we can use more ecologically sustainable materials. So this is one of the topics on which our unit is working. Second very much related topic to that is cooling, because urban heat obviously is a huge issue. Uh, we see also this uh, here in Brazil, but all over the world is becoming more, a more serious issue. We can address it through how we build our housing, what kind of equipment we're using, for instance, uh, we uh, at UNEP, we are working in uh, countries like Morocco, for instance, where we are trying to establish innovative financing mechanisms to help uh, women's, uh, women to buy uh, air conditioners which are more ecologically friendly, not having uh, dangerous substances which are harmful to the climate. So lots of things we can do on this. So the cooling this is a second topic that we're working on. The previous panel was about food waste. So I think food waste in cities is another topic where we can do quite a big difference. So it's also my invitation to maybe working also on this topic together. And of course, the urban planning, uh, building climate cities through urban planning, this is the first topic that uh, we're working at the cities unit. And of course, we are working on very important issues because uh, I also, Kobe, brought some of the, uh, I just looked at some of the numbers that, uh, of course, cities, uh, you know, they today house 68% of the global population and it's growing. And uh, cities producing 70% of the carbon emissions. Uh, they are uh, consuming two thirds of the global energy, 70% uh, of all the global natural resources are used by cities uh, and, um, 50% of the global waste are produced by cities. So it's a lot of the impact by cities, but we know and here we see also lots of pilot activities by cities where cities make a difference. And this is why we at UNEP, we are, would like to, we are working very closely with the cities and the cities network because cities is huge power. You know, you can do quite a lot to improve the situation and we see many, many examples where actually cities take a lead in addressing global problems. So we're really going through this multi-level governance to the very global level. And uh, at UNEP, we're really trying to make sure that using this multi-level governance approach and the whole of society approach, we actually addressing all the issues of uh, loss of biodiversity, uh, climate change, uh, but also environmental pollution. And these three topics are interconnected, very closely interconnected. So for instance, uh, uh, in several conventions and multilateral agreements, uh, cities are engaged implementation of this global agreement. For instance, convention on the biodiversities, uh, there is a global action plan uh, where uh, cities are engaged directly. At the Paris Agreement, uh, there is a, a, a CHAMP initiative, the high-level initiative for engagement of the uh, local actors. And so we at UNEP is really trying to make sure that in the treaties like plastics and others, actually cities are represented because you can make a huge difference. So uh, going back to the discussion today, uh, I'm very glad that uh, we are working actually very practically together with you on several initiatives. So first of all, uh, together with ICLE, we started uh, a generation restoration project, which is supporting 25 cities 
uh, in the very concrete pilot projects, and I mentioned already Manaus, uh, but also uh, there are some other projects, for instance, in uh, uh, Barranquilla, Colombia, uh, we're working on the Leon Creek restoration, addressing the water pollution issues and biodiversity issues. Uh, in Mexico, there is a, a restoration of the gloom, uh, uh, green and blue uh, uh, ways. So, and today we hear about many more, uh, many more of these examples. But I think uh, not only uh, support of the cities and building capacities and the networking and engaging them in the implementation of global agreements. Uh, we should think about the innovative financing and this is what we're also again working and uh, looking forward also to hear about you know how the cities are addressing the financing issues. From our side we're really also uh, trying to work also with international financial institutions make sure that uh, finances are available directly to cities without too much of the bureaucracies. It's a very big work uh, because it's also changing one mentalities, changing the cities, uh, you know, the systems, institutional arrangements. Uh, but UNEP produced already the nature for finance doc, uh, reports uh, and uh, I think the financing uh, in addition to the governance structures are really important topics that we would like to work together. So I think I will stop on this and really looking forward, Kobe, to hear from our colleagues from cities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gulnara. And what a rich presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, oops, let's just... Uh, so I would just like to say, ladies and gentlemen, that it wasn't mu much more than a week ago that I was with this champion lady in Bonn at the climate, Media Climate Talks. Uh, she's not only a champion for nature, she's not only a champion for buildings and constructions and cities, but also in the climate space where we work together on things like the Sharm el Sheikh Adaptation, uh, Adaptation Charter. You mentioned um, a champ. We did so many initiatives. And I honestly just want to say that our relationship with UNEP is rich, it's getting richer, and it's important that we work in this multi-level governance approach with the United Nations within the context of the United Nations. And if we mention now the Plastics Treaty as well, here we collectively take hands to make sure that the voice of cities and indeed the actions and the commitments of cities and regions, all levels of subnational governments, are written into this plastics treaty, which is set to end plastic pollution by 2040. And my colleague, who's moderating next to me here, Magash and I do, will tell you much more about the plastics treaty as well. It's like one big family. We have three sessions here, but we're all talking about more or less, you know, sustainability, different aspects of sustainability. So it's wonderful to have such a rich Ickley family here in front of us. And it's now my honor to call on stage our first panel. Um, we are very honored to have a lineup of esteemed speakers for our first panel. They're going to share their city successes, successful nature-based initiatives that contribute very directly to the global biodiversity framework also called the Biodiversity Plan, adopted in Montreal, um, and the UN Decade on Ecosystem re system Restoration, which Gulnara has mentioned. I'm now very happy and very, very honored to call to stage Honorable uh, Deputy Mayor of Montreal, a uh, real champion city Montreal, uh, Laurence Lavigne Lalonde, Deputy Mayor of Montreal, Canada, a champion city for biodiversity. Please, please come and join me, uh, Deputy Mayor. And anyway, you choose the seat. And then also, Louise Tamaso Guzzi, Secretary of Food and Nutritional Security of Curitiba, Brazil. Curitiba, in many ways, is where our journey together on biodiversity and cities have started many years ago. And it's such an honor to be back in Brazil after so many years of starting that journey together in Curitiba. Mauricia Mira, Head of Environmental Department of Cali, Colombia. Cali, you have big shoes to fill, working in the footsteps of Montreal and Kunming and so many other host cities before you for the upcoming COP16. The world's eyes are on Cali, and Italy stands with Cali, and so do your previous hosts. So welcome on board. 
And then Arthur Phillips, Senior Policy Strategist of Austin, the United States. Welcome on board as well. The speakers uh, are now going to uh, speak to the following. Um, um, so, uh, you know, it's been two years, really, more than two years, um, since we collect collectively hosted the CBD COP15 and Associated Summit, and the international community adopted a groundbreaking new biodiversity plan, one to make peace with nature, for humanity to restore its relationship with nature, because we know if we keep on doing what we're doing, there is one way, and it's not a pretty way. As an urban leader, going to you, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, what is your perspective on the important role that cities should play in contributing to the implementation of global biodiversity targets? And also tell us what Montreal is doing, the opportunities and challenges you face, and what are you doing to protect biodiversity in your city? Thank you. Thank you very much. Is it working? Okay. Yeah, I hear myself. Uh, well, thank you very much. First of all, I just want to say I'm really, really happy to be with all you, uh, the, all those cities here, and uh, we'll be with you for the next months to accompany you with uh, this great, great uh, um, desafio <laughs> that you have. <laughs> Sorry, I'm mixing my languages. These kind of meetings does that. Uh, well, yeah, we, we hosted the, the, the COP15. It was a really, really great moment, and we were really happy to have all the community coming to Montreal and participate in those huge objectives that we finally got to, uh, to sign. Uh, we were really happy to see that a lot of... Uh, that the parties uh, adopted the, um, the global biodiversity framework, but even though... Um, it's something that was th that took place at uh, the country level. We all know that the local community, the the regional community, are the one that are, that are are always their hands on the ground, implementing those uh, those dreams and those ideas and those solutions. So, um, well, for I. I I really appreciate that we can have those kind of, uh, of forum to share our expecti uh, expertise, our solutions, because we know that we all uh, struggle with the same, the same challenges, that we, we are the one facing the greater uh, impact of climate change, of loss of biodiversity, but we are the one at local government that has less um, money, less, uh, le less uh, money to... to to put those projects in, in, in place. So being all together, sharing experience is really, really something that we, we are great to be part of and that is really important. I think that we, we, sh we continue doing that. Um, Montreal is doing um, a lot in its territory, of course. Uh, we, uh, we, are, we, we are an island. Not everybody knows that, but Montreal is an island. So regarding the objective that we had at uh, come in uh, Montreal um, Global Framework to preserve a lot of 30% uh, of our natural space, Montreal at the, uh, has the objective of protecting 10% of its territory. But just to achieve that, we would have to buy and protect every green space in the island of Montreal. So it's a huge step that we have to, to do and we are working to do that. And also something that is quite new in our um, capital work program that in, in our projection for the future is that because we are, we are an island, in the past years, we, a lot of private, uh, private um, um, owners tried to, um, to, uh, to put a lot of concrete uh, to, to make sure that the, the water, to, to prevent flooding. But we all know that this how now has a big impact as well. So we have to work a lot on our riverbanks, on the shore, and we are working really hard in our territory in Montreal, what is um, um, the, 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 what we own as the city to make sure that we can uh, renaturalize the, the, shore, the, the banks and protect uh, a lot of those areas. But we, no, we own a, f a really small percentage of all the, 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 the shore. So we really need to work in a collaborative way with other owners so we make sure that we can, we can work in those um, 
to, to achieve our objectives and protect more biodiversity. Um, we do a lot of other stuff, but I think we'll have another round maybe, or should I go? No, 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 please. I, I don't go? think I we can have another round. No, so I, I, I'll, I'll keep going. Are we going to have another can we have another round? Very I'll small wrap up uh, another round. But okay, so I'll just you. keep going f with a few things that we are really, really proud of. Um, the city of Montreal, uh, we own a lot of parks, of great parks, not local parks, but greater parks. Um, and in the past last, in the past two years, three years, we um, developed two greater parks. One great, great park in the east of Montreal with its um, most uh, indres industrial area we had a lot of uh, of issues with uh, those uh, industrial area the quality of the air so it was really important to protect all the the green space that were there and we did the same in the west end of the island of montreal where we still have a, a few agri agricultural uh, um, sites so we wanted to protect those as well uh, so we we decided that we would protect those sites and create greater parks but Again, inside those two huge territories, uh, it's more than uh, 30 kilo square kilometers, um, so it's quite big for the island of Montreal. Uh, inside those territories, there's a lot of, uh, of um, land that uh, we don't own. So again, we are working with institution, with uh, government, with uh, particular to make sure that they agree with, with our vision, that they would be also willing to put a their money to pro to protect those uh, those uh, green area because a lot of them wanted to sell those area for development and we said no it's not possible anymore so this is the kind of things that that we do and maybe one last thing because we are we don't have a lot of time um, that we are it's it looks small but it's really important for biodiversity for many years we 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 wanted to plant more trees Trees is important. It's it helps reduce heat island. We, we, you all know the, the the impact of planting trees, but it's really in the last couple of years, two years, three years that we uh, really uh, had had a new program to also plant shrubs and to uh, divert uh, the. Um, the grass so we can have uh, more uh, increase the biodiversity and we also launch a um, strategy f to protect pollinator as well so it's all re re we are working at all the scale that we can to make sure that we protect biodiversity and we increase biodiversity in our territory thank you so much deputy mayor and i think you know just listening to what you're saying i mean there's a lot of economics in here and a lot of money that we're talking about and a lot of complexities and partnerships. So what we're also talking about is multi-level governance uh, from global to local and from local to global. But what you're pointing out is that we're looking at working with land users and there's a lot of long-term discussions, relationship building, trust that goes hand in hand with working together as a community really to bring nature into cities, keep it there, protect it and restore it. And you just highlighted some of these very complexities and the finances and the economic arguments that go alongside it. So thank you very much and congratulations to, the, to Montreal and the wonderful work you are doing. You are a beacon of hope and a highlight city for many, many other cities that they learn so much from. Please continue what you're doing. If there is time, and you can all think about this. I'm going to give you like 20 seconds as a closing remark after this panel discussion. But thank you very much for that. We're now going to move on to our second speaker, uh, Louise Guzzi, Secretary of Food and Nutritional Security of Curitiba, Brazil. É um prazer estar aqui o selado. De fato, Curitiba eh, participa dessa rede do ICLEI e de maneira muito ativa. Curitiba tem muito a contribuir porque tem no seu DNA o espírito da inovação e a atitude de inovar. E vem fazendo isso de uma maneira a atrair o setor privado, o terceiro setor, criando um ambiente na cidade para que se tenham inovações no sentido de exercitar a política de tecnologia social e o uso da cidade. Esse tem sido o verdadeiro motor da construção de ecossistemas sustentáveis 
ingrediente essencial no avanço da agenda pública de biodiversidade urbana na cidade. Outro ponto importante é o fortalecimento do planejamento da cidade, na concepção de projetos, na coordenação da estratégia integrada de proteção à natureza. Outro ponto importante é todo esse trabalho em rede que acontece e nós participamos da rede do ICLEI, do NEP, do LUPA, da FAO, do C40, do Pacto de Milão, importantíssimos no trabalho é, de construção de redes. Isso nos fortalece é, e torna nos mais resilientes ao enfrentamento desse processo é, de, 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 de buscar saídas e soluções integradas. Outro ponto importantíssimo que a gente quer destacar é o nosso compromisso firmado com a Agenda 2030. Isso tem norteado as estratégias do município de Curitiba, onde Curitiba almeja e trabalha para até 2050 neutralizar as emissões de gases de efeito estufa por meio da implementação de ações elencadas no Plano Clima e no âmbito de, do transporte, energia, da segurança alimentar, da gestão de resíduos. Outro ponto fundamental, e o nosso prefeito tem buscado trabalhar em cima disso, é a partir de uma gestão pública eficaz e responsável e transparente. É, isso nos dá e nos fortalece a nossa capacidade de promover ajustes fiscais na cidade. Isso torna a cidade de Curitiba com status e a capacidade é, de buscar financiamentos internacionais para dar suporte para essa toda a inovação que a gente busca. Bom, do, dessa forma, né, entendemos que é, temos fatores que nos credenciam a ser uma cidade como importante referência global possuindo uma ampla pauta de boas práticas replicáveis, fruto do planejamento urbano, focado em iniciativas inovadoras que inspiram a prática da cidadania socioambiental em consonância aos sistemas alimentares sustentáveis. Eu respondo pela pasta de segurança alimentar e a gente vem buscando trazer a pauta alimentar para trabalhar com um protagonismo importante com essa pauta é, dentro do da, dos avanços da biodiversidade. Isso torna o nosso trabalho é, fortalecido e virtuoso em redes. Thank you so much. And Curitiba has led in so many ways on the biodiversity front. And lately we hear more and more about your wonderful work on urban agriculture and how you also connect and support other cities and learn with other cities around urban agriculture. So thank you for being such a pioneer, not only in this co on this continent, but also globally. Thank you very much. I'm now turning to where the world is coming, to Kali. Um, our next panelist is Marisha Mira, head of the environmental department of the city of Cali in Colombia. In a few months, your city will host COP16. President Gustavo Petro has declared this the COP of the people and of making peace with nature. The whole of government and whole of society approach underpins the biodiversity plan and is crucial to ensure we make peace with nature. What are Kali's plans to ensure the voices of cities and regions and also that of the whole of government and people and communities are heard at the COP? Word over to you. Thank you, Lewis. Okay, uh, um, I will do it in English. I will try. Um, <coughs> so, as you know, I mean, we normally have two years to, for preparation of the COP. We got only a few months. Um, uh, but at the same time, we're working closely with the government, uh, of course, the Ministry of Environment, all, you know, at na the national level. We work in a centralized country. Uh, but at the same time, Cali is working, you know, uh, uh, closely with the, with, the, with, the, with, with the national authorities and, of course, uh, different organizations. And we're going to have uh, the COP for the people, and, you know, a lot of... Uh, uh, institutions and organizations are going to be, you know, working hand to hand with with the municipality. 
and uh, we got already uh, the 26 and the, from the 26 to the 28. At the 26, we're going to have a, a cities and a subnational uh, summit uh, in Cali, and then the 27 and the 28, we're going to work with biodiversity uh, cities and with uh, a lot of organizations with the indigenous from the Amazons and, and different, uh, the Afro in, in Cali, which is, by the way, one of the biggest cities with Afro descendants in, in Latino America. Um, so we are all coordinating, you know, in order to make sure that people are integrated in this uh, in this COP, because after all, we are uh, you know, we're the host of the biodiversity COP, but remember that Colombia is one of the biggest biodiverse countries in the planet. Therefore, it's a national. It's, it's very important not only for, of course, Cali, but na in, uh, on the national le level, all the cities are going to be involved. And of course, you have to hear all the you know people involved in this in this transition, because at the end, what we want is to show how we can grow. It, now they're talking about economically, in balance and harmony with nature and make peace with nature, which is the key of what we want to uh, develop in this uh, COP16. Uh, uh, already, uh, you, you have, I can tell you that I, I cannot, I mean, I'm not sleeping. Um, it's, it's a lot of work. We're working hardly here with my colleague here, Lina, and everything. I mean, we got all the secretaries because this is not only from the environmental point of view, of course, but it's a sustainable, which means you need to work with all the different secretariats, sec secretariats of the municipality. Mayor Alejandro Eder got this in his heart. President Petro got it in his, in his heart. We want to decarbonize the city. This is in interesting. What's happening right now is that dialogues that we didn't have in Colombia are becoming you know, dialogues for transformation to the evolution to change one city, business as usual, to a greener city. And this is something that, that the magic of the COP is doing already. Wow, fantastic. And I just want, if it's going to help, we know, yeah. uh, we know that sometimes, uh, you know, as Montreal will tell you, as Kunming will tell you, as other cities, Bonn, etc., will tell you, uh, there's not a lot of sleep happening yeah. in the months before, before a COP. But I want to assure you that the ICLI team is also not sleeping much yeah, before I the know. COP because we're there with you. And we are all very privileged to be here today because there's one excitement in the ICLI offices ahead of a COP, when the COP is announced and when the national government, the party that will host the COP, unveils the logo and the slogan of the COP, we then get to work because we have the privilege and the relationship with the United Nations uh, Convention on Biological Diversity to officially host with them and partners like UNEP and others um, and the host city, of course, the official parallel cities and regional uh, events at these COPs, the summits. And we get to work. Our design team loves it. They wait for that moment that the logo and the slogan is unveiled. And then they get to work. And they design the cities and regions logo right next to it. And today, yeah, you are going to be the first people that will see this beautiful, beautiful logo unveiled on this stage. I can't wait for it. I can't wait yeah, either. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. And good luck. Um, we are now moving, um, um, a, ve very, uh, a very big thank you to you. We are now moving to our last uh, speaker on this panel, and I turn to Arthur Phillips, Senior Policy Strategist of Austin, Texas in the United States. Today there are numerous collaborative initiatives that ensure the value of nature, like Cities with Nature as a partnership initiative, and the Berlin Urban Nature Pact come to fruition and fulfill its obligations. Can you share more about Austin's commitment to these initiatives and why other cities should also join? And if I may just say, you will be happy as a Cities with Nature city to know that at least three cities, I believe, have signed up, including the first city from Chile today to Cities with Nature. And please invite other cities in the audience or regions. This is the moment to sign up to Cities with Nature. Over to you. Thank you. Um, the city of Austin is, is very excited to be participating in this conference. And, you know, the city of Austin has been 
very steadfastly since the 90s investing in the environment. We have been land banking, we have been building our infrastructure, and we've been focusing on water quality. Bring closer, okay. we can hear you. Um, also, renewable energy. Okay, there it goes. I can hear myself now. Um, and, and today we continue to grow and evolve our environmental footprint. And so in December of 2022, we went to Montreal and we uh, attended the Biodiversity Conference. We came back to Austin and we brought those targets back to Austin. And by the end of January, we, um, we created a resolution that asked city staff to make sure that the city of Austin environmental policies were hitting the Kunming Montreal targets that were listed in the framework. And so we really value these partnerships and we believe that we are more, we are stronger and more resilient together. And we were very, ex oh, sorry. <laughs> We're super excited to be working with uh, global partners. And we feel that, um, you know, the Na Berlin Nature Urban, the Urban Nature Pact is very exciting and it's coming soon. And we would hope that everyone here would come forward and sign this pact, which will be happening in Colombia at the Biodiversity Conference uh, in October. Thank you, thank you very much also to that invitation. Let's note that. And for those who can be there, I think you know it's always valuable for our community to get together because it's so enriching and inspiring. We have the opportunity to come back, and I was kidding a little bit about the 20 seconds. Um, you know, I would like to say, let's take a minute or two for each of us to reflect and highlight anything else you would like to from your different city perspectives and leave us with a message uh, that we can take and reflect on when we all go back to our various constituencies, our cities, our regions, our organizations. Uh, for ICLE also, how we can serve you better, how we can partner better, but most of all, what are your thoughts that you want to leave this panel with as we are looking at a future, an urban future with nature? And I'm going to ask our next COP host, Carly, to start. And then we go down this row and I will make some concluding remarks. Right. Thank you very much. I only have one minute. <laughs> one or two, one or no, two. But uh, let's see, um, let, I mean, part of what we want is to show how we can grow as a civilization, as a, as a city, in harmony with the environment. But at the, but at the same time, you have to show the benefits. And show the benefits means show economical and social benefits. No, you, 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 I mean, we got a lot of policies in Colombia. I was a uh, deputy minister in Colombia once, and I create, we create the payment for environmental services, for example. And it's been a very good policy in Colombia. We create as well something called green business policy as well, that uh, with criteria you can that, you know see which company, which uh, enterprise is a green green business in Colombia. We did it in Peru as well with the World Bank, and uh, so, but it's growing. These things are growing, but showing the numbers, showing the economics of it, the social aspects as well. Of course, it will do the magic, and this is the part that we need to work a little bit more, showing the, the numbers of how growing and you know, create wealth in harmony with the environment and have a rest restorative economy. You can have that as well. That's the key of how we can grow as a, not only as a city, but, a, but as a civilization. And this is what I take. I'm very optimistic and I've seen it. But we need a little bit, you know, bit more faster in this action uh, that we have to do, not only, of course, climate change, biodiversity, all together. Yeah. Well, fascinating. Um, you know, uh, what strikes me is how much we're talking about the economic side of this whole uh, context of nature. Uh, Ten years ago, the economics was almost, you know, we didn't know how to speak about 
economics and finance when we talked about nature. And now we see our cities have deeply engaged with this topic and they're making the argument for investing in nature in very concrete ways. So congratulations. And the other fascinating thing is that you mentioned that you were once, you were once the minister, deputy, uh, <laughs> deputy minister at the, at the national level in Colombia. And now you are working in a city. Yep. We see this trend more and more. We've always seen, and I mean, this is also true for Curitiba, Paraná, national government. You know, we, we see mayors moving up to national government, but we also see the other side happening now, where national government ministers actually come and work in cities because they understand that the policies happen there, but the actions happen exactly. here. So I want to congratulate you and thank you very much for leaving us with those very wise words. Uh, Deputy Mayor, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, um, I have a personal thing that I want to say and after that I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with, uh, and I'm going to realize to a few things you, you've said. Um, there's something I'm really, I'm personally really proud that we did in Montreal and it's a, we did a ban on pesticides. And I think it's a discussion that we need to have more worldwide and more stronger. And I mean, it, it's, it's kind of easy for Montreal to do it because we don't have a lot of agriculture, but we still have a few and we, ha we have a few golf and they, they, really need, they, they were really not happy with our bylaw. But pesticides, it's really something that I think we need to be stronger on. It has a lot of impact on our health, on our biodiversity, on our uh, water. So I think it's something that we need to, to go stronger together on, on that issue. Um, and it goes to what I think we need to, to do and to how to, we need to, well, two things. We, how we, as you mentioned, uh, we adapt the way we talk about biodiversity be, because we need more accept, social acceptability. We need more people to believe that what we do. So I think we all uh, adapt our, the way we talk about it to make sure that we can connect with uh, the financial sector and the economic sector because we wanted to to stop fighting ab ab about those just two way of thinking and we needed to show that it had a really great impact in the economic uh, in the economic world as well a sector as well so i think we we kind of manage that pretty well uh, it's not over we still have to fight in our cities and at the, we, we, there's a lot of polarization and a, lo a lot of misinformation uh, that we need to fight against but i think with the collaboration that we have, the re realizing that we all face the same issues, we uh, together adopt the way we, we, we talk about those issues to make sure that we uh, can have the floor, not only on, um, on at the cup, but also uh, with in, in other sector, uh, talking about finance and things like that. And the only, th I want to uh, conclude as I started to say thank you to this, um, those different, place where we can collaborate, uh, uh, exchange, um, share our knowledge, our, um, our, the thing that we, our, I'm sorry, I miss, uh, I miss words in English tonight. It's, it's been a long week. It's been but, a long uh, day th as well. Th th we have strength, but we also have place where we are not as good as others, so we can all share and all learn. So I think, I just want to say thank you to this, to Iglei and all the, uh, the, the other cities that are participated. It's really helpful. Thank you very much, and thank you for that very personal reflection as well. I think, you know, what, what, what you touch on here is about also something we do in ICLI in our water work, is talk about the value. We talk about the value of water, but we also, you're talking about the value of nature and how we communicate about it. And it's not only on stages like this and towards the United Nations. It's in our households. It's in our communities. It's in our workplaces. And, you know, it's about the personal personal value you have towards nature, realizing you're part of nature, realizing there's a value, intrinsic value in nature itself, and also pricing nature for what it is really worth and what it is contributing to our world. So thank you very, very much for those reflections. Let's turn to Secretary, uh, Curitiba Secretary, um, uh, Maricha Mira, for your reflections. 
é muito inspirador o que a gente está escutando aqui. Eu também vou fazer uma reflexão pessoal. É, nós temos que trabalhar modelos é, que geram referência, porque é, esse modelo econômico materialista está nos trazendo um preço muito grande e que nós não temos condição de pagar. Nós temos que gerar referência porque as pessoas, as comunidades têm que ser enganjadas, porque elas têm que perceber significado naquilo que elas fazem, naquilo que elas veem na cidade. Curitiba hoje já tem 60 metros quadrados por habitante de parques. Curitiba assumiu um compromisso de plantar 100 mil árvores por ano, já chegou ao patamar de 400 mil árvores. Curitiba vem crescendo na utilização em várias áreas de energias renováveis. Mas quando a gente fala em gerar significado, nós temos um grande desafio que é, através da agricultura urbana, ajudar esse resgate do significado na vida das pessoas para que a gente possa reformular os nossos hábitos de produção e consumo. Então, nós temos, a partir da agricultura urbana, um desafio onde junta a pauta alimentar e a pauta ambiental onde nós temos um projeto chamado Fazenda Urbana, onde esse projeto é dentro de um parque, mostrando que é possível produzir e respeitar o meio ambiente, gerando conexão com vários atores, agricultores urbanos, agricultores é, é, periurbanos, empresas, empresários, formadores de opinião. E assim a gente consegue ser mais uma referência global para que a gente possa efetivamente mudar o modelo mental o quanto nós estamos precisando. Thank you very much. And you know what? I'm on stage a lot and sometimes I do the most craziest things. And here I gave you the wrong name. I called you Secretary Mira. Uh, but I think you'll forgive me for this one and I'll, I'll get it right this time and say you are Secretary, but you're actually Secretary Guzzi from Curitiba. And you'll forgive me because you will sleep for the next couple of months and he will not. So um, my apologies for that. <laughs> Let us now turn to Austin. Let us now turn to the United States and uh, really get the, the final word here from Austin by Arthur Phillips to conclude this first panel. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you. Um, Right now in Austin, and I think many cities in Texas, we are grappling with the balance of density and nature. And so many of the cities in Texas have been laid out in a very suburban manner, but we need to densify these cities so that we can live more environmentally, more sustainably. And so we're having a lot of pushback from some people as we move in this direction because um, they're afraid of change, you know? But it's, it's more sustainable. We're investing in transit as we move forward, and it's better to have shared public spaces as opposed to just everyone having their front or backyard. And so um, that's where we are now. We're making great strides towards improving it. We just passed a housing initiative to allow more density within the kind of the single family footprint. And we're really hoping in the next couple of years, maybe you know, the next five years, we can be coming back to ICLEI and telling you about how this density is really helping the environment. It's helping our public spaces, which we can make more uh, biodiverse. And um, that's just where we are today. Thank you very much. And we'll take you up on that challenge. Come back in five years and tell us. And also, as you learn and as you go along, the process is very important for us to learn from, you know. So let's share that process. And I invite you, share that process on Cities with Nature, that wonderful platform. So thank you very much to this wonderful first panel. I want to say let's give them a round of applause while we invite the next panel up. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Family picture, let us quickly take a family picture and then the next panel, you know who you are, please get ready to come up to stage.
I think we made a couple of new friendships here, if I'm not mistaken. Now we're going to go to our next panel. And as I said, they know who they are. So we're already joined by Cape Town on the one side and by, um, let me just get my place on the program here. Um, Devson Mora Braga, Director of Forestry and Sustainability of Manaus. And we just heard UNEP speaking about Manaus, of course. And of course, our dear friend Annelise de Brain from the city of Cape Town, uh, where Ikli Africa is hosted. It's my home too. So Annelise, very welcome on stage. Um, you're going to speak a little bit about uh, your initiatives, your work that you're doing under Generation Restoration, something our colleagues from UNEP mentioned before. Um, you're both participating cities in, in uh, uh, Generation Restoration, UNEP's project, and um, the Generation Restoration project, for those who do not know, focuses on promoting restoration at scale, particularly in urban areas. It is financed by the Federal German Ministry of Economic Cooperation and uh, Development. Many of us know them as BMZ and implemented by UNEP with support of and in coordination with the UN Decade Secretariat and of course ICLE's Global Biodiversity Center. These cities are living proof that with strategic financial investment, sticking to the finance theme here, meticulous planning and robust collaboration, restoring nature within urban landscapes is not only feasible, but can indeed elevate the quality of life, our mental well-being, and create urban environments that reduce biodiversity loss. Annelise de Brain from the city of Cape Town, South Africa, will present first and followed immediately by uh, Devson Mura from the city of Manaus in Brazil. Annelise, the word is yours, and then over to you. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. So good afternoon. Now that you've all seen my slides about 10 times, um, I'm going to go very rapidly through it. Um, so I, I bring you greetings from Cape Town, uh, South Africa, uh, from our mayor and our city manager. And uh, we're very thankful to be here, uh, sharing some of our experiences. Um, as you will see, our experiences are really dealing with our involvement in the restoration generation programs. And it is really trying to address the triple crisis that we have also on the African continent and in the southern part of Africa. So basically, uh, Cape Town uh, is a city of about 5 million people. Um, and we are known to be one of the biomes with the largest number of species in the smallest uh, uh, area. And therefore, we have learned quite um, a long time ago that you cannot uh, move these species. You have to uh, build and uh, the city around them. Uh, Cape Town is also known to be a, a, a coastal city with about 307 kilometers of coastline. So some of the examples you'll see later on relates to that. Um, in our city, we, we have found that the most important thing for us is that we have integrated uh, development planning uh, and budgeting that runs on three and five year cycles and then very long term planning um, running on 10 and 20 and 30 year cycles. And that involves all of our line departments. And so as a metropolitan government, most of my examples will be uh, relating to, to our metro. Um, we also have a variety of um, uh, sort of strategies and policies that helps with the sustainability. And then in the slides that I'll show now, you will see the blue slides mostly relate to our integrated planning products and the pink slides relate to, to our programming of certain projects and budgets. And then I want to show you two slides about what we do in our M&E environment. You can also find the hyperlinks to these products online uh, once you get our slides. So um, I think one of the lessons we've learned in Cape Town is that it is very important that we have dedicated people working on dedicated planning on very specific levels of planning. So our uh, urban planning system is developed uh, on a metropolitan level, a district level, um, a local level, precinct level, and, and earth level. And we have dedicated teams integrating all of our planning processes together with our environmental management frameworks uh, from the metro level up to uh, uh, every earth level. And it's NGIS and every citizen can go up to the earth level and see 
uh, on electronic media and on our electronic viewers what is happening in the neighborhood and um, what is being spent in there or planned to be spent in their neighborhoods. And that was very helpful for us. Um, another, uh, now I'm moving actually to some of our bigger programs. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of Day Zero, but Day Zero is a phrase that Cape Town has coined. It was the day we thought our city is going to run out of water. And that was a very important day for us. And it became a mass communication, sister, uh, communication campaign in 2018 when the city had to find a way to, um, to help our citizens to continue to have drinking water because we were about to run out of water. And so concurrent to our mass uh, campaign and getting our citizens to save water, uh, the city also established the Cape, uh, the Water Fund, and it was a collaboration between multi-level uh, governments. And uh, the intention of it was to clear alien vegetation in some of our catchment areas. And you can see the statistics there, but we've cleared about 46,000 hectares of land from aliens, and that not only helped us to protect our biodiversity, but it also helped with fire protection, job creation, and above all, it saved us a billion liters of water, which, uh, which really helped us through that mass crisis. Um, one of our other programs is called um, a land banking program. We uh, have uh, legislation that protects our biodiversity, and when uh, a certain property owner wants to develop close to waterways, or close to our biodiversity protected areas, which is on red on those maps, they have to uh, either uh, stay away from that or they have to pay offsets or they have to uh, buy other land. So the city itself has a large biodiversity um, uh, land bank uh, process where we buy up land that's owned by private people and then we uh, develop it for an outdoor um, uh, outdoor activities and recreation. But it's a, a big initiative uh, together with uh, different different landowners. Uh, one of our other programs is um, uh, dealing with the coastal erosion. So you can see on the, uh, on the photos that we have uh, quite a lot of uh, coastal erosion and um, a storm event implications. And we, we follow certain infrastructure solutions, but one of the things we do is also the dune rehabilitation. Um, and we have a coastal edge, which is a legal line we declare on a map, and everybody above or below it cannot build. The, it's huge control, and uh, that line is not even visible on uh, this photo, but it sits on the other side of that parking lot. And anybody who would put any stone or any brick inside that line uh, needs to follow a serious big process. Um, uh, one of our last projects um, is a livable urban uh, waterway program. What we do here is we work uh, between all of the line departments, uh, especially from the engineering, um, the stormwater management departments, together with community uh, facilitation uh, on identifying all of our river corridors. And I'll just show you one or two more pictures here. For example, you can see we d delineate 200 meters on both sides of all the river corridors, whether it's a single river or the larger basins. And then we collaborate with the communities who stay closest to those um, rivers that identify community projects for active and passive recreational spaces, uh, cleanup campaigns, and those kind of really uh, practical things that communities uh, can be involved with. And these then goes on a, m a major budget uh, with the, all of the different line departments um, for, uh, f yeah, obviously for the restoration of the river basins. Um, this is the last uh, small project I want to show you. Um, it really is called uh, Asanda Village. It's one of our many community projects. And it, it was a wetland that was in between uh, an industrial area, a school, and an informal settlement or an inner city slum. And uh, it looked like this before, and there was just no care by the community about this wetland. Um, but there was a need for the children to have a kickabout um, and that the stormwater uh, would be handled and that the wetland be managed. And so actually, finally, we managed to get uh, design on board, communities on board, and construction is now completed. Um, so you can come and have a look at that. Um, I want to close with one or two extra slides. Um, these are uh, evidence of our public-facing uh, monitoring and evaluation report. It's called Spatial Trends. You can search for that, Spatial Trends Cape Town. And you will see um, we publish every year uh, about a 100-page uh, 
report uh, with very simple indicators um, where we measure and uh, figure out how are we uh, maintaining our biodiversity. So, for example, the little maps on the top will show you that we are losing some of our biodiversity, but at the bottom, you will see that actually we are buying much more land and protecting officially more land than what we are losing. And so these documents are very useful uh, for the public to keep council accountable and the different line departments. There's another uh, example of one of these pages from those reports. It's, it's in maps that show us which pieces of land we bought over the last uh, year and exactly how many hectares uh, are going into formal conservation. Yes, so I would like to show you a nice picture about Cape Town. Whenever you come to the most friendly city in Africa uh, as a digital nomad, uh, to come to work or play in Cape Town, please call us. Uh, we need lots of thinking, critical questions, and we're very willing to learn from others like yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Annelise. And I can only say, please come and visit Cape Town. Um, we're now going to uh, directly move over to Manaus, another beautiful, wonderful city. But just to say, hats off to an African city. It's, there's no, it's no wonder after this presentation why so many cities, even from the most developed worlds and uh, uh, parts of our world, actually learn from our planning department in the city of Cape Town. Well done to you and for the great work you're doing. Over to Manaus. Our presentation is just loading, I think, um, for the Manaus presentation. Can I get an indication from the back? Are we getting the presentation? All right. I'm going to already just while they are looking for the presentation at the back please just already say that uh, our next panel i'm going to introduce them to you so that they can get ready to take the stage while we load the presentation and let me get my notes um it's a fantastic panel that is going to um uh talk to us about um innovative tools and solutions that pave the way for systemic change in combating biodiversity loss and can serve as an inspiration to all of us. That panel is going to consist of Sang Jing Shin, the mayor of Seng Nuam of South Korea, or Korea, Alfredo Coro, the mayor of Del Carmen, Philippines. And I want to also say Mayor Del Coro is not only the mayor of Del, Del Carmen or Mayor Coro, he is also the global executive committee leader in ICLI for the portfolio of biodiversity, water and one health. And Anil Kumar, another mayor, the mayor of Kochi, fantastic innovative city in India, you may, many of you may have heard about the innovations from Kochi. And then Alejandro Bravo, a councillor from Toronto, another trailblazing city from Canada. So what a wide variety of speakers we're looking forward to achieve, uh, inviting on stage. And do we now have your presentation? Not yet. We're working on it. Please bear with us. Uh, I must say the technical team is handling a whole lot of presentations throughout the day. So um, let us also give them a little bit of time to find the right presentation. In the meantime, if I can ask the panel that I've just uh, announced to already make your way to the front so that we can have a very quick transition um, uh, after this uh, intervention. The alternative is also that already, please come and sit down. Please already come to stage. Um, the alternative is that we start this panel discussion and come to you uh, when the presentation is found. All right, I'm indicating. 
that we are going to um, that we are going to start this panel discussion. Uh, we just need one more chair. Um, Mayor Koro, if, if you don't mind, please take the seat. I'm going to stand. Please take my seat. Um, all right. So this panel, as I said, we're going to talk about innovation. And um, we're going to start with uh, His Honorable Mayor Sang Jin Shin from Sengnyam in South Korea. Please, you have the word. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. It is a great honor to be here to introduce Songnam City best practices to the East Team Ecolay members from the world of, around the world. Songnam, a city of 920,000 and located next to the national capital Seoul is currently leading the fourth industrial revolution in the Republic of Korea. We have a highly skilled workforce of 80,000 people working in cutting edge industries such as game content, biohealth, fabrics, and ICT. But we are not just about business. We are also a leader in environmental practices. Just next to our apartment buildings and high-tech clusters, you can find 73% uh, se of the city is green space. Alongside the beautiful Tanchon River that flows through the city. Using the latest technologies, we are implementing various uh, uh, practice to make uh, sure that nature and the uh, cutting edge coexist. First, uh, our city is uh, serving as a bridge to bring citizens and experts together to protect biodiversity. For the first time in Korea, Songnam City has introduced a natural resources platform that encourages citizens to upload their personal observations of plants insects, birds, and other wildlife in the city. Through a, current, uh, through a recent uh, agreement with the National Museum of Science, uh, the material is verified by export and transformed into meaningful, meaningful scientific data for biodiversity research. Based on the platform, Songnam City has successfully restored over 40, uh, over 40,000 big data entries in, onto the global biodiversity information facility to be shared with the entire world. Another strength is our active partnership with the local companies. In March this year, we signed an agreement with HD Hyundai world leading game company Neowis and other major, major companies to promote biodiversity and achieve carbon neutrality. With the help of the city government, uh, the companies sit side, set, side, uh, set aside funds and personnel to assist with the recovery of endangered endangered uh, species, as well as the planting of native vegetation and the removal of invasive species from wetlands and parks. We will continue to provide opportunity for companies to share their resources with local communities to create a win-win partnership between the corporate government and citizen sector. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And what a wonderful example of citizenship, community, and of course, local economic injection with your local companies. Thank you and well done. And we look forward because I believe the ICLE leadership will be visiting South Korea very early in 2025. We look forward to hopefully also visit you. Thank you very much. We are now moving to an island city, 
Del Carmen in the Philippines. We're going to hear from his Honorable Mayor, Alfredo Coro, about his city. And Mayor Coro, um, I want to chair, uh, put to you that your city is not only an island city no, for, known for its rich marine and terrestrial biodiversity and idyllic beaches and impressive mangroves, but your city has also suffered very directly from climate change and extreme weather events. What advice, lessons and best practice can you share on how your city has overcome these obstacles to foster resilience, sustainability and reduce biodiversity loss? Hello. Um, good, morning, um, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, a pleasure to be here uh, to share the experience of a small community uh, in the Pacific side of the of this world i am from del carmen um, we are uh, part of uh, shargao islands which uh, started 13 years ago as one of the poorest in in our country now we are a growing economy that's uh, highly urbanizing uh, because of our strategies that allowed us to move from people trying to who were so poor that they were trying to sell organs to survive and children eating sand to live, to now an economy that's thriving on tourism and growth on creative and ICT industries. Let me start with sharing with you that because of our efforts, we, are not, we were considered by Condé Nast, a leading tourism in this, um, magazine, as the number one island in the world in 2021. That transformation, together with our experiences with extreme weather events, regardless of what's happening, uh, is based on our strategy that focuses on environmental management and conservation first as a strategy. That effort of our community to focus on social behaviors to allow people to appreciate the change that's happening is anchored first primarily on understanding the ecosystems. There's a need for science to be able for people, especially those with um, cultural experiences and heritage to understand and appreciate that the current context of climate is also affecting our previous practices of culture. And in the process, because now you have the science, we'll be able to create better policies for us to move forward as we transition from a very rural area towards an urbanizing community that allows sustainable development and balanced development that are focused on nature-based solutions and ecosystems-based adaptation. The thirdly is to communicate. There's always a need to regularly communicate between local communities and in the investing community. When you are growing as an economy and as a city, there's a lot of interest in terms of potentially businesses that will come in because of profitability, especially on the hospitability, hospitality and tourism sectors. But that has to that investing public has to also appreciate and understand that there is a need to balance heritage, values, and profitability. And I think that approach that we have done so far in our community allowed us to continue to protect the interests of the local communities at the same time, allows them to participate in the process of inclusivity uh, in terms of investability. We are now growing, we are growing fast, and we are growing um, in the manner that we want to grow. And I think that's a, that's a key message that we need to share to everyone, that regardless of where we are in the world, because of the globalization that we are now experiencing, there's a lot of invest, investors coming in from different parts of the world. And when you enter into localized communities, there has to be a respect on the culture, there has to be respect on the plans of the local community. There has to be respect on the vision of the local community itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. And let us just be very clear. The Mayor told us that not too long ago at all, children were eating sand and people were selling organs, their organs, to stay alive. And now you have turned this around within a couple of years 
and it's under your leadership. So let us not underestimate how brave and bold our leaders sometimes need to be and what can be achieved with your type of determination and leadership and kindness and compassion. And I think the mayor didn't tell you, but Del Carmen is one of the hottest surf spots in the world. And he also says that after the hurricane, they decided... We can turn our back on the sea, we can be scared of the sea, we can try and keep it away, or we can embrace the wave. And for the surfers in the room, and I see at least one colleague who's a surfer, uh, I can only say, go and embrace the wave in Dal Carmen. The mayor will welcome you there. Thank you very much, Mayor. We are moving ahead in our panel, and we have found Manao's presentation. We're going to go back to Manao's after this, after this uh, panel. We are now moving to India, Kochi, another beacon of absolutely shining example of what can be achieved. Honorable Mayor Anil Kumar, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good evening. So, uh, more than a shining example, I would say that we are a very small city, but ready to learn. And we are almost on the southernmost tip of India. So, uh, and our pro close proximity to the ocean, to the sea, also makes several challenges because of this climate disasters and the uh, changes that is happening uh, because of the uh, climate change that is happening. So, I would tell you an example of how we are trying to restore a canal. We actually have many canals inside the city. And one of the important canals is called the Tevara Perandur Canal, where the UNEP and the ICLA are joining hands to see that this canal is restored. And the name of the project itself, and she is sitting just in front of me, uh, UNEP has named the uh, project. You, you, you told about the project. It is Generation Restoration. So something is very clear, that we are not doing something great. We are only restoring. We also have another project for all the six canals taken together. The name of the project is Canal Rejuvenation. So that means that after all these kinds of development and all the urban development that is happening for years, we are actually trying to destroy whatever has been given by the traditional knowledge, by the history, and by the culture that we all had. So we are trying to recapture all these things. See, this particular canal, uh, what we are trying to do as part of the initial projects of the UNEP, what we, are, we were trying to do is that we were trying to participate people to see that they at least tell something about this canal, some reminiscence about the canal, how the canal has evolved, what is the reason for the important names of places along the canal, what has been done in the canal, what is the history of the canal. So this is how the public is participating in this particular, even the old photographs. We have asked people to even upload old photographs of the erstwhile canal that was there. So this is happening now. See, what I'm, I wanted to tell you is that the history of the canal shows that it was used for trade, it was used for farming, it was used for urban, uh, uh, for urban uh, cultivation, not urban cultivation, culti agriculture, and then for transportation. What happened? The story is the same, whether it is in the capitalist world, I am hearing the story for, uh, for many, uh, across many sessions, what I hear is the same story. Because once development starts, you have been reclaiming the wetlands, you have been uh, engrossing on the uh, canal sides, uh, you have been uh, uh, outletting uh, very, very... Uh, uh, bad sewage water into these waters. So this is all happening everywhere. So the important context of what we are trying to do is to clean up the entire thing, have the people's participation into it. So this is one part of the story. The second point, I'll, I'll, my time is up. I'll, I'll, I'll brush aside very fast. Uh, the second thing is that I told you about the participation of the people. I believe that there should be a change in the value systems of the people. Without a change in the value systems, I don't think that we can restore anything. So doing certain things for monetary gains instead of that, to see, to have a cultural change inside the city is what we are trying to do. We have also, earlier also we were trying to uh, participate the children also in certain competitions wherein 
they can identify a particular uh, problem inside the city, a nature, natural problem inside the city. It can be urban flooding, it can be waste management, it can be uh, 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 water pollution, anything it can be. Uh, to Maybe it, it will be like a painting, it can be a small film, a documentary, anything the children in the schools and the colleges can do uh, to participate in, this, uh, in such a program. We also developed a program called the Sustainable Neighborhood. Sustainable Neighborhood means in two communities we did this. That is solar paneling, uh, then nature-based solution for sewage, uh, waste management, decentralized waste management. So that is, that is why I am t t trying to tell that it's actually a kind of, uh, everything should, uh, should be an integrated approach should be there when we think about nature-based solution or when we are thinking about reju rejuvenation or generation restoration, what we are planning to do. And uh, two more points I'll, uh, very, very fastly I'll tell, one is the issue of technology. That is why I told that Kochi is ready to learn from many places uh, what is happening anywhere in the world. Uh, I was hearing for an, uh, you were, I think you were also there that, uh, yes, you were complimenting him, the Australian counselor from the Oceana group. He was telling about a soldier fly. We have already implemented that in Kochi. 100 tons we are doing. Two private companies are doing it. Uh, you so, tell him. Yeah, no, you know, so what, what I'm trying to tell is that technology may be available across the globe in different cities. So Kochi is, try, is ready to learn. Why Kochi is trying to, uh, ready to learn is because uh, we are the only cosmopolitan place in Kerala. I would say, tell one more sentence about Kerala is that it's the most, uh, we have the health standard just like Europeans uh, in India. So, but we don't have the economic uh, standards as Europe. So, uh, even Amatya Sen uh, wrote about it. So, this is the beauty of a place from where I come. And we send people across the globe. Uh, I was talking to my counterpart. There are people from Kochi even in Canada. Uh, you have people in US, you have people in UK. Everywhere you have people. Even Seoul, I believe that people will be there from Kochi or Kerala. So, we are ready to learn from technological innovations that are there. Uh, so that is the third. So uh, ICLAI, I think, is also a, opening up such an opportunity to learn many things. And finally, I, and uh, to add to that, Chinese nets. You won't find a Chinese net in China, but we, will, we can find Chinese nets in uh, Kochi and India. So that is the beauty of the place. And uh, finally, I want to tell you is that uh, financing is also one of the important challenges. Whatever you do, Whatever uh, thing you want to do, whatever ideas you have, whatever speed with which you are going to implement it, whatever technology is available, financing is also something that is very important. And I look forward also to this conference so that I also get some of the solutions. Thank you. Mayor Kumar, thank you very, very much. And this is the beauty of the world of ICLEI. We are all human beings. We are all equal. And so are all our cities, large and small. So even though Kochi is a small city, you are a beacon of hope and inspiration. Thank you very much. I like standing now, in fact. I'll stand a bit more. But anyway, thank you very, very much. And also for the wonderful work that you're doing. And what passion this mayor is speaking with. This gives me such hope and joy for the future. And now we turn to our last speaker of this panel before we come back to Manaus. Uh, Alejandro Bravo, Councillor Alejandro Bravo from Toronto, please share your message with us. Thank you. Uh, can, is it working? Okay, uh, Toronto has uh, about 30 years of uh, expertise and work in ecological restoration and urban forest management. Uh, we've been developing new tools for setting priorities, focusing efforts, and, and making uh, land use and management choices um, to see that it has a positive impact on biodiversity. And what's really central to our work is that we're focused on equity. We've been using geospatial data um, to see how urban forests are changing. Uh, we've been um, evaluating la large-scale tree planting. And, and to speak to the question of um, of this incredible network, uh, Generation Restoration. Uh, we've, we've been able to work with other uh, cities um, and with other partners in the US. Uh, and so we are helping uh, realize for residents the benefits of, of the urban canopy. Uh, but what I wanna say around our tree equity approach is that we are aligning uh, 
census data with other demographic information. Toronto is half, more than half of the population uh, born outside of Canada. Uh, majority, uh, almost 50% uh, racialized are, are people of, of color. Um, and we want to make sure that we're matching the opportunities to realize the benefits for people, the health benefits, the well mental health benefits, the economic benefits in an equitable way. So our work has been around biodiversity, pollinator protection, uh, ravine and forest management, uh, green standards. But I also want to highlight other forms of knowledge that are really important, indigenous knowledge. For example, we just had um, a controlled burn in the largest park in Toronto, and that's inspired by knowledge of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. So I think that um, ultimately what we're talking about here is equity being at the core, uh, where climate action is uh, indivisible from indigenous reconciliation and community economic development opportunities. We've uh, obviously working in partnership with many institutions, uh, and you know that that's important for ensuring that our data is constantly being refreshed, refreshed and applied. Um, but I want to say that to us, nature-based solutions are a powerful tool um, for addressing the critical challenges of climate change. They're not, uh, they impact in Toronto as well um, and in the biodiversity decline. And we, we see this urban forest as a really important tool for a good practice. It also makes life more affordable. And I think it's really important to highlight how uh, progressive studies, uh, 2015, at the neighborhood level, people felt richer, they felt more happy and, and younger uh, by having a better bio, uh, biodiversity. In 2017, we calculated our ravine strategy, uh, generated 822 million Canadian dollars um, in ecosystem benefits for things like increased recreation, reduced rates of depression, reduced healthcare costs related to an activity, and in 2018, our urban forest study showed that 55 million Canadian uh, dollars annually were uh, the savings realized from energy, sequestered carbon, pollution removal, and reduction of stormwater, uh, which is significant. Um, but I want to just uh, close by saying that it's really fundamental to the power that we have to make policy and to have political consent from the public to expand our efforts economic and, and worker interests, social inclusion interests, these are all inextricably linked. And to go back to the idea of indigenous knowledge, I've learned that the economy is the way that we take care of our responsibilities to each other and to a nature. And uh, what better growth principle than ecological restoration, um, than equity? Um, it's much superior to exploitation and greed as a growth principle. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Councillor, for highlighting equity in your last statement, but also very much the issue of wellness and actual health benefits of nature. And I just want to say this on behalf of my dear friend and colleague uh, from the World Health Organization, sitting here, Christina Romanelli, uh, championing One Health across the uh, World, uh, World Health Organization, FAO, and so many others in partnership with ICLI. Uh, thank you very much for recognizing how important and closely connected nature Nature, health and well-being is. And may Dalcora, may Cora from Del Carmen, thank you very much for taking up this combined portfolio of water, health and nature in ICLI. We are in good hands and in good leadership with our leaders at the, on this panel. And I just want to now ask you, please bear with us. We, please t stay in your seats if you don't mind. We are now going to invite our colleague from Manaus up to give his presentation. I believe it's ready now. And then we will take a group photograph. And I want to ask you, please stay in the room because you will be the first ones to see the unveiling of a thing of beauty, the logo of COP16, the official eighth summit on cities and national, subnational governments, after this presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm a representative of the city of Manaus. We are located in the northern region of Brazil, in the, at the very heart of the Amazon rainforest. And as you can see from the, the, the slide, we are surrounded both by the river and, bo and the forest. And, uh, but the city itself has a lot of large ecosystems within the urban area. And 
the, the, the one that we are working with is a big river that's within the urban area of the city. And the river is called Mindu. Uh, this word, the garapé, is a native word that we use to call uh, local rivers, smaller rivers. And this is the total area of the watershed, the Mindu watershed. Uh, it's the largest watershed in the city. And uh, as you can see, it encompasses a lot of different neighborhoods. Actually, uh, it's 15 neighborhoods from uh, the upper course to the lower course. Okay? And the Mindu, the, Mindu, the Mindu River, the Igarapé do Mindu, suffers from a lot of different uh, problems. This is the current scenario uh, that you can see. We suffer from plastic solution. Uh, we suffer with uh, informal settlements. Um, lack of basic sanitation, and uh, most of the riverbanks have lost. Most of the riverbanks have lost the original forest, the riparian forests along the river, and we have also had a lot of biodiversity losses. And we are in uh, with UNEP. We are on 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 the path for restoring these ecosystems and to change this reality. We have some ongoing activities that I'm going to show you. We have installed some of those floating uh, barriers, trash barriers, to uh, make the retention of plastic pollution. We have uh, set a couple of them, and the intention is to set a lot of, uh, a lot of them uh, on the lower, middle, and upper course to reduce plastic pollution. Of course, this is uh, a mitigation strategy. We have to work even further to uh, on the depo the depollution of the, the this river. Another strategy that we have been working on is the relocation of people that used to live on the riverbanks. In these pictures, you can see areas that we have removed people in informal who lived in informal settlements, and we have relocated these people, and we are now creating these linear parks to function as buffer zones for the, the riverbanks and also to create green corridors, biodiversity corridors. And we're also creating some retention ponds to control, to help prevent floodings in the nearby areas. Uh, uh, besides that, we are working on the reforestation. We want to restore the repairing forest that used to be there uh, before the informal settings, settling, settlements. And you, as you can see, these are, um, these are, this is our team. They are working on planting native trees. Since 2021, we have planted more than 5,000 uh, native trees along the, the riverbanks to restore the riparian forest. This is to create a buffer zone and to help uh, improve the biodiversity and also help connect some forest patches. Because uh, along the river, we have some areas which still have forest, uh, still have vegetation, and we, but they are forest patches. And we are creating, replanting trees to connect these areas to allow biodiversity to flow. We also have a huge uh, um, action with the community. We aim at, com at community engagement when we are planting these new trees. And uh, we also work with nearby schools to promote uh, environment, environmental education to raise awareness for the, uh, uh, regarding the importance of protecting the, the river banks and uh, the biodiversity along the river. Uh, we're also working uh, on, on planting uh, uh, native fruit trees because we realize that people uh, usually take good care of fruit trees because they know that those trees will soon give them fruits to eat. And these fruit trees are not only important for the population, but also for animals, for birds, for example. These fruit trees, they are native fruit trees, they will help attract the biodiversity, the fauna, some rodent, rodents to these areas once they are, the, the vegetation has been restored. 
another strategy that we are using uh, to implement in the territory of the Mindu watershed are the vegetable gardens. We are working with schools to promote these vegetable gardens uh, as a strategy of urban agriculture and also food security and, uh, and environmental education. Uh, we have set up uh, three of them and uh, we have, as you can see, the, the, the kids from school, they, 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 they take part in this and they are using those vegetables that are grown in the, their schools for their, 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 their meals in the school. Um, okay. And this is um, a, a, sum, a summary of our, our project's roadmap. Um, we are mapping out potential areas for uh, agriculture and, and uh, ecosystem restoration sites. Uh, capacity building for those stakeholders uh, and community and stakeholder engagement. And also, we are planning to draft a bill to, to, for the uh, urban agriculture and ecosystem restoration policies in the city. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. This is a bit of our uh, project in Manal. Thank you very much. Let's take that seat. Thank you very much. And I think we have, now, we have now seen so many inspirational stories. Gulnaro, please. Uh, Annalise, please. We're going to take a family picture. But before we do that, there's one more slide, which I hope we can show you now, which is about the unveiling of the logo of the eighth summit of local and subnational governments. Um, and um, everybody else who wants to actually come and join us up on stage with this beautiful logo. You can see the COP16 logo there of Colombia. That is a flower that never stops blooming. What a beautiful logo. What a symbolic logo. Making peace with nature. The theme of COP16 right beside it is the 8th summit on the 26th of October, you can see the key partners here, and you can see that it is actually going to be part of a program running from the 28th, 25th to the 28th of October in this part of the world, in Colombia, in Cali. We want to see you there. So please, with these final words, Gilnara, uh, Annalise, anybody else who wants to be part of this family picture, now is your moment to come up to stage. Thank you very much to all the speakers.